Mr. Ray Johnson came to our hotel, the Barron's Coven in Sag Harbor, on January 13th, 1995, and checked in. He had uh, walked up to the bridge and undoubtedly uh, jumped in the water. It happened to be a very, very cold night, and his body was found the next morning in the Sag Harbor Cove, which is the bay that uh, surrounds our hotel and the bridge and um, where he had jumped. This is a list of uh, 100 people, and they were asked to supply information on how many hamburgers they eat a week. It's just a list of very uh, well-known celebrities, and movie stars, and people, and artists, and writers, and so forth. Well, well I guess I didn't make this list. Before. You are not on that list. You are. You are on my. Bunny, I don't, you're on bunny lists. No, but I know you were eat hamburgers. So let me. Mm -hmm. you know, be well, then that would be no hamburgers per week. Right. Uh, Zero hamburgers. Very early when I knew Ray, I was having uh, dinner with him out in, in a Spanish restaurant on 14th Street, and it was towards the end of the meal, and um, the restaurant cat jumped up on top of the table and stuck its head in the cream pitcher and started lapping up some cream which amused all of us. And then the next day in the mail, or the day after, I received an envelope from Ray that had different things in it. Among them was an old chromolithograph ad for some company that showed uh, a, a kitten uh, lapping cream out of a cream pitcher. So I was, pretty <laughs> I was pretty impressed with that. In 1962, I lent one of my early works, 1961, package to Sydney Janet Gallery exhibition. Called in New York? In New York City. I was, we were living in Paris at that time. The package was exhibited in that exhibition in autumn of 1962, and we received the first letter from Ray Johnson, I think, in late November 1962, uh, asking us if he can buy that little package. And he said, unfortunately, he was not rich enough to be able to buy it. Could we send him a package? We took a photograph of the package. Then Christo put a note on the photograph. And the note said, Dear Mr. Johnson, you asked me to send you a package. I have sent it to you, but you have destroyed it. Keep the photograph as a souvenir. And of course, when Ray Johnson received a package by the post office, like any normal package, he opened it, which means he destroyed it, and found the photograph inside that said, I sent you a package, but you have destroyed it. Keep the photo as a souvenir. I think Ray suffered in, in his lifetime because he was uncategorizable. I mean, he didn't make paintings, he didn't make sculptures. I mean, he did those things in a way, and actually did make paintings at one time in his life, but um, he really invented this, this thing which hadn't existed quite before, and uh, I think that's why he's, why he's great.
to start to correspond and maintain relationships with other people. I think that Ray was a kind of illustrator of other people's lives uh, because he was always sending them references to themselves or to things about themselves. And very often he was the one that could show somebody in the art world that they were doing something extremely foolish by showing how foolish it was, by following it to its logical conclusion. That was Ray's function in the art world. He was almost an in-house jester. I do things postage stamp or postcard size. I do things postage stamp or postcard size. <laughs> I'd say that I heard from Ray well, maybe once a month, not not all that often, but every now and again things would come in a great bulk. It was always great excitement to open a letter and read it, and lots of fun, and they were perfect. I don't know if I can explain that by saying, but his sense of putting together a collage and... Uh, writing and typing and little pictures. Nothing could have been added and nothing could have been left out. They were masterful. The infinite amount of little things he was involved in sending to hundreds of people every day, just like this, is an amazing activity. But I think he did that as a result of him sort of not being taken seriously as a visual artist. And so he was so compulsively self-obsessed that he said, if I can't do it that way, I'll do it this way. I'll do, if I can't do it in galleries, I'll do it by mail. He used to create schools in front of my eyes, like when I would send him something, he'd send me back like this September 4th, 1982, Coco, thanks for the Linda Montana pages, which thus becomes the Montana Correspondence School, added to the Illinois School and the Texas School, and these are two other schools he made for me because we met people in the street or, you know, we talked about things and he made a school. And then uh, he said, your dinner was great, you're such a good cook, Ray, and put this gorgeous drawing of this big thing coming out of one of his eyes, which was very typical of Ray, these big, long, tube, tubular things that come out of the eyes with a little dot. A lot of people think of the correspondence school as the network of artists who exchange these things through the mail, but I think the New York correspondence school was also Ray's um, one-man movement and his whole way of um, dealing with the world and his whole sensibility uh, you know, towards art and towards the world. But the way he reached out to others, that also became the New York Correspondence School, and so everybody that he touched was part of the New York Correspondence School. And that's how the, um, you know, the mail art dialogue develops. Like, I send you something, it might be fairly anonymous, it might be something that I could send to anybody. And as this goes on and on, we both begin to get smarter about the other person and so then this, this private language begins, and we have all sorts of private jokes and uh, references that other people might not understand at all. So that's why I, um, I question the idea of mail art being you know, sold and bought and owned by other people and admired by other people, when in fact it was just intended for an audience of one, you know, or maybe a couple of other people. I don't agree with the idea that mail art is spe special because it's an individual object. I believe mail art is special because it reaches somebody with a message or with an object that might change their life. The idea of being able to communicate with other people in the world by a postcard is a fantastic idea, and if that postcard is really art itself, 
then you've really moved art from one place to another instead of telling somebody about it. It's the, it's the exact opposite of what normal letters and communications are about. could never really do away with the correspondence school because it was so much a part of what, what he was all about. And even if he'd wanted to, he probably couldn't have ended it because people would continue to send things back to him. There were more postcards going back and forth in the United States, at least, amongst artists because we were totally isolated, all of us. He plugged into an already existing system, and he did it well. He radically moved it forward. He got people interested in knowing that maybe there was a life part to the art world not just a career part. The idea of bypassing the system, of using the mails, of, of having people add on to or, or devaluing, making something free, cheap, um, out of the gallery system is exceedingly important. That, of course, precedes Fluxus um, and precedes the Internet, obviously, and, and uh, in a way precedes the idea of artist books, which were all phenomena of finding alternatives to the gallery, commercial gallery system. And so for that, I think he's extremely important. I don't know his his family background, which generally is the reason people become what they are. Well, I know he comes from Detroit. Uh, his father uh, was a working class man. He worked for the uh, you know one of the auto companies. At the time of his death, um, the newspaper reported that he had no immediate family. Although I believe later relatives were found in the Midwest. But he certainly seemed to be uh, a loner and not really in contact with his family, which might strike one as a bit odd since he was in contact with just about everyone else by telephone or by, by mail. He had a form of manic depression that he claimed was because he was Finnish. Ray was the most neurotic person I ever met. He was the most successful postal bitch in the world. He was an episodic neurotic. And by that I mean that he never actually did anything at all that did not have a highly neurotic meaning to it. I think that his depression was he had personal problems that had very little to do with his place in the art world. But it would come out that way. He was a very, very uh, American in some way. He was uh, cool, but sometimes extremely warm and elegant. And uh, uh, he was always talking very softly, but actually sometimes was saying some very nasty things. <laughs> no, not nasty, but, but strong. Uh, but he was saying, and so uh, he was talking like that. Jean-Claude, you understand something I can tell you? <laughs> <laughs> he would softly say very strong things. <laughs> it's very hard to know when you speak to Ray just exactly what his mood was, because he could be, uh, he could seem to be uh, rather annoyed or, um, I don't know, somehow... Uh, not on an even keel, and yet he could be using that as a as a device to elicit a response in you. I mean, that's the whole idea behind correspondence: is that an action provokes a reaction. The star is taking a trip in Southern California this weekend, all for a good cause. They bundled up in Big Bear to raise money for the March of Dimes. And the event was hosted by our very own Terry Murphy. My boy here with the event.
my first uh, meeting with Ray Johnson was with a musician, Marzette Watts. I was walking down the Bowery with Marzette, and Marzette said, oh, there's this cool guy you'd like. And he was standing on the Bowery in New York City in front of those platforms that they take in and out of trucks. And on it was a collection of postcards that he had designed, that he had altered, photographs, bits of work, and he was selling them on the Bowery. And at the, in those days, in 1959, 60, 61, the Bowery really was filled with penners and uh, poor people. And then later he came by Marzette Watts' loft, and we talked and we became friends. And after that moment, I started to be on his mailing list. When you look up the date on it, he was one of the earliest ones to be um, in touch with and interested in making art that included uh, images from popular culture. I remember him from 1963. In those years, uh, there was this little scene in New York City of young artists, you know, uh, who, were, who who had either had their first show or or was just about to have. And they went on. They went on to become called uh, the Pop Artists, and Andy Warhol, and Jim Rosenquist, and Roy Lichtenstein, and everyone was, was was really young, not famous, and working in New York. And and it was a, everyone got together. So it was seeing Ray in the context of Andy Warhol, coming up with with that sort of cheerful smile and sort of radiating energy and vitality, coupled with infinite cynicism. Andy Warhol really loved Ray, and Ray adored Andy because he Andy was so great. And, um, and and the other sort of element which was really important was that they were gay. He was very early doing doing work, you know, in the fifties. Um, probably, bef maybe in some cases even before Richard Hamilton. Not to mention uh, Warhol. I guess the most interesting thing is how prophetic some of his things look. I okay. do know that he did a uh, book illustration. And curiously, they are almost interchangeable with Andy Warhol's illustrations at the time. Uh, they have a very similar kind of feeling to them. It's curious, uh, uh, graphically and, and in a kind of naivete. I mean, it's, it's a complicated relationship or a complicated thought because Andy sort of uh, totally appreciated Ray's work. But somehow, the bottom line was that Andy knew that it wasn't commercial for whatever reason. And Andy, Andy and all of those guys at that time, even though they were young and as they grew older, they knew what they were doing commercially. They knew they wanted to become famous and rich. And uh, somehow, uh, Andy saw that Ray didn't. I mean, he loved Ray's work, but somehow it was in a different league. I don't really think of Ray as a pop artist at all. I think of him more as a Dadaist. I think of him as the heir to Schwitters, someone who collects seemingly worthless scraps of, of bits of paper, bits of bus tickets, but it was just a very natural extension, I feel, for, for Ray to incorporate these pieces of popular culture, if you like, but he really brought them into a much more resonant sphere, I think, by making them very personal. He's a transition between um, Marcel Duchamp and pop art. I mean, he didn't come to it all on his own. I'm not implying that Ray didn't develop his own thing. He did very much so. But his sensibility was very much in line with people like um, Cornell, Duchamp, uh, the, the surrealists in general. Uh, the whole thing was that that art was a big secret that the bourgeoisie could never figure out. Even his death was meant to be an ongoing puzzle that would confuse the bourgeoisie for years to come. I can safely say that Ray 
uh, believed that Marcel Duchamp was uh, very influential and that very few of us would be doing what we were doing had it not been for Marcel Duchamp. Excuse me, uh, do you know something called West 7th Street in Locust Valley? Uh, this is Blind Hat. This is uh, 11545. Uh, hmm. I feel since his death that there are many people in New York who want to portray him as a kind of solitary hermit in Locust Valley, but that wasn't true at all. He uh, was very much part of the community here. He had a very definite re routine every day. He brought Newsday in the New York Times. He did chores. He took walks a lot. He took beach walks. He talked on the phone. Um, he went to the post office. He would be driving around in his car. Right, yeah. On your left, past the bank, you'll see a shopping center. There's a post office in there. Okay. Quiet, little eccentric, I think, in his own way, but obviously. But, you know, he was pleasant, happy, and you know, never bothered anybody. So. This was like an envelope. There's all, uh, like, papers sticking on the outside oh, yeah, of it. We don't know what that means, but... Somebody would send him something, and then he would do something to it and send it back. And then it would come back again and have different writings on it. Oh, he used to get a lot of things. He used to get a sneaker, bottles. Um, you name it, he probably got it. Ray gets more more mail and he's been dead for a year and a half than I get and I'm alive. A Coke bottle or a plastic bottle with stones in it, with drawings on it, and that would be for him, yeah. He gets ton, tons of mail. Dirty sneakers, Dirty socks. Sneakers. Coconuts. 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 Everything, Rips. I'm telling you. Whatever, whatever you can mail, he's gotten in the mail. They'll send it to him yeah. knowing that he's dead, yeah. so we have to send it back to him. It's either forwarding, time expired. He did not usually invite people to his house. He was very, very private about that. It was a small house on a kind of um, suburban street. I believe it was called the Gray Lady. He had a very big mailbox. It was absolutely amazing because the whole first floor of this little house, there was practically not one piece of furniture in it. The rooms were completely empty. Uh, there was a kind of, I mean, that was my impression. I think there was some furniture. I think there was a work table with a chair. And, and the upstairs was absolutely filled to the brim with boxes full of things and massive material all over the floor, all over the bed, all over everything. So it was a total contrast to, to what was below. Every time I spoke to him on the phone, and we spoke three or four times a week, he would be banging like this, or doing different things and, and hitting something and, and doing uh, things to his works, you know, or, or scratching out, scratching out like this, or, you know, you would hear him working all the time, and you would also hear the TV on at the same time. <laughs> now, you know this guy? No, who is that? That's me. A long time ago. A long time ago, yes. No. Well, so this is a portrait, right? A long time ago. Maybe we can have it like this. Oh, right. More. Right. Like that, right? Okay. Abstract expressionism. Ray did a couple of portraits of me. As you know, Ray's approach to doing a portrait has nothing to do with the way the person looks has nothing to do with, let's say, the conventional view of making a likeness of a person. As example, he showed me a series of buttons uh, that had the number of holes that amounted to the letters in my name. Uh, there are nine teeth, L-E-S-L-E-V-I-N-E, -E -E. you're a nine. So this is also a portrait of you. And what I'm going to mail to you next week, since I didn't know I was going to have to explain this today, was the same button. Now your teeth would be L-E-S, L-E-V-I. The whole thing was very, very, well, surreal and abstract. In other words, if Ray had told me, this is a portrait of you, 
I wouldn't be able to figure it out. It's the kind of connections that only his mind would make. Apart from the um, collages or apart from the letters or apart from the sentus, another main category for me were his performances, the kinds of what he called lectures, and I went to many of them, was part of some of them. Uh, they were done also um, pulling things off the top of the head with a basis structure, starting with a base structure but always pulling things out and depending upon uh, some kind of audience participation. It was a typical Ray. You received a, a, a thing in the mail, of a Xerox page, that uh, announced a meeting. He was always having these meetings for one ostensible reason or in honor of one person or another. Um, and he decided to have this stilt meeting in Central Park, so it became Ray Johnson's stilt meeting. And we all just gathered there, and there would be stilt walkers around, and there were people who could, who would help you to learn how to stilt walk with low stilts and things. For example, uh, he did a performance once on the rooftop of a parking garage, where he carried a ladder back and forth across the, the, the parking lot. And uh, we all kind of sat around and waited for him to climb something with this ladder, but he never did. And the ladder appears as a motif in his work fairly regularly, uh, but he just seemed to have uh, liked the shape of the ladder and decided that if he, if he moved it back and forth like that, he might also be making a point about how uh, you, you move from one area to another by climbing a ladder, but you can also carry the ladder and make it move. But that was it. That was the performance. At the uh, Hillwood Commons and in C.W. Post College, I think it was 83, um, he called together one of his meetings, and he had given out envelopes at the door, and he, uh, different things were put in the envelopes. And during the course of the, of the lecture, he had a stack of things, which became, each one became a mini-performance. And at the very end, after doing all these mini-performances, he opened an envelope that had ice in it, and he took the ice, and he wrote with the ice on the blackboard, which made it very dark because it was wet. He was starting to write, please send, but he moved the S from send to the back of end to say ends, and that was the end of, of the lecture. It was brilliant and absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Um, in the 80s had sent me three pages, one that said Ray Johnson collages, one million dollars each. Then the second page was Ray Johnson letters to David, and that was David Bourdon, uh, two million dollars. And the third one was Ray Johnson free artworks, uh, three million dollars each. And then I had added a page and sent it back to him that said Ray Johnson calls, which was his telephone calls, four million dollars each. He'd call anybody about anything. If he woke up in the morning and he had trouble with his fingernail, he would call anybody that he happened to have the telephone number of and tell them how special they were, and that he was only calling them, and then he would call three or four other people with the same problem. This was his way of telling the world he was alive. I think one of the most interesting things about Ray and I um, corresponding was that we did a lot of it over the phone. We used to call each other, he'd call me, I'd call him, and we would have these conversations, and I would write a lot of it down, and I have a huge database of information that I jotted down while I was talking to Ray. He would start with um, saying, pre-pop shop, pre-pop shop, pre-pop shop, like six times. And then um, he would talk about doing um, a Gracie Mansion skirt, and then he would talk about Lil Picard, uh, how she died at 94 and that Jeff Hendricks called him weeks after, and uh, that Annie Albers also died at 94. He was always making like comparisons in the art world. He knew so much about people in the art world. It was just incredible, and they would come out in his telephone conversations. And then he said, I said something about um, um, turkeys were bred for feathers, and he was talking about cracked bones and dodo birds and, and ant soup, and we talked about ant soup, and about uh, putting one ant in a cup of boiling water and how his recipe for that, and then 
um, he knew someone who made rock soup. And I talked about Barbara Rue because I knew she was making, uh, boy, you know, uh, washing and cooking rocks. And then he talked about his looking at the fifth one, which we were talking about the swans. He kept on seeing swans on the beach. So this was the fifth one he sighted that season. And uh, this was May 13th in 94, just a year before he died. He'd only call me concerning subjects to do with men in drag. He was fascinated with the whole concept of men in drag. And that's what his phone calls were about. Did you see so-and-so in that bar last night? Or were you at this party? Did you see so-and-so? Should I do that? Could I do that? Would you do that? Will you do that? Will you send me a photo of you in drag? I'll send you a photo of me in drag. You know, on and on and on. That's what he talked about. That was his obsession that I know of. And I think he had different obsessions with different people. I remember one time he called me to ask me what movie it was that uh, could it have been Joan Crawford or somebody like that threw a typewriter out of a window. I mean, he needed this information. Of course, I didn't. <laughs> I had no idea which movie it was. But anyway, he would call up and ask things like that, or he would call up and ask you what your fa- who your favorite artist is. Like he's making a survey. Something like that. It may have started with an impetus to call for a particular reason, but it always right away reached out to all different places. And it was a tremendous amount of juxtapositions of things that he uh, either knew or was calling up from his repertoire of things that he knew or knew things that he would think about. And that's what I found so brilliant. It was like creating art right on the phone. It was very incredible. He was a man that at any given moment could pick up the telephone and call anybody, anybody in the art world, and they would talk to him. If that's what he wanted from his life, he was a success. I never knew how he got along, how he managed to get along, because he didn't show a lot. And I don't know, one, one would hear that he would sell things to... that an Italian dealer would come and he would sell a bunch of stuff, but I mean, that you just heard that as a, as a possibility. I, how he managed, I don't know. A number of the people that he was so close to, like Andy Warhol, um, had become so famous. And I think he could not allow himself to be part of the gallery system. And at the same time, I think he felt quite disillusioned that he was not well-known and not more successful. I think Ray did want to be known for his art. I think that he felt somewhat neglected, uh, perhaps partly because uh, other members of the circle uh, that he had been associated with in New York City in the 50s and 60s became quite well known. But he did choose a very intimate form of art making that was one-on-one. So perhaps uh, the irony of it was that he created the circumstances in which he would be less likely to achieve celebrity and at the same time use celebrity as as one of his primary motifs. Somehow or other, we're talking from New York to Denmark about the New York Correspondence School of Ray Johnson's. If that's not success, I don't quite know what is for an artist. You don't need to get a Nobel Prize. And in fact, you don't need a retrospective in a museum. Art is about stream of life and involving yourself with those issues that you choose to to see as something outside of popular culture that can be integrated back into popular culture. I see Ray Johnson as an extremely successful artist. I got a telephone call from the local police department asking me if I knew a Raymond Johnson. And I said, yes, I did. And they said, well, um, do you know any reason why he would be in this area? Because he lived some distance away, about 75 miles. And I said, yes, I think he's coming to my museum to draw a picture of his skull. Um, Why do you ask? 
and they were a little hesitant at first to explain, but then they did tell me that his body had been found. I was not the person here that checked him in, but from what I understand, he had come uh, to stay with us and checked into the hotel and then proceeded to um, go to the bridge where uh, they believe he had jumped off and found his body the next day. The autopsy report had been negative on all indications, no disease, um, no um, drugs that, that might have induced a depression or anything. So it was really quite mysterious, and the only conclusion that you can draw is that he definitely decided to do this. Where he jumped, he faced this little town, he faced a 7-Eleven, he faced the post office, and there were two girls under the bridge who really heard this splash and saw him and tried to get help and they weren't able to get help. Well, we are located in Sag Harbor about a block from the village right on the harbor. Um, our view is primarily of the bridge. Um, it's a very lovely little cove, um, it's very scenic. He was preparing for it for a long time and he wouldn't talk about it. He said he was doing his, the biggest work of his life and he, and he wouldn't give any clues, any sent clues though. He said uh, I saw a picture of a man who drowned out there, who was floating out there in this particular, in this harbor just the other day. And he said that it was such a beautiful image. So, you know, he gave clues, and we will never know because he did so artfully. I absolutely believe that the whole trip prior to his suicide and uh, the date were all planned. And after he died, I went to see the bridge where he jumped because I wanted to see if I thought it could be an accident. I don't think so. It's a very small bridge about 30 feet over the water. I don't know really any further details except you know that he had left his car near the bridge and that the police had come the following morning and um, asked us you know whether he had been here because the key to his room was found on him. He did not leave a will as far as I know. Uh, there really wasn't any attempt to contact uh, his family. Uh, he didn't leave a, a note or any indication of the, that, that he was uh, feeling like uh, committing suicide. And he had plenty of money in the bank. He had just done some work fixing up his house. It was just seemed to be the opposite of any kind of uh, terminal activity. Near the end of his life, he did some mailings um, about death. Uh, called Happy Death Day, and uh, which was odd. And, and then he called and he said, oh, this is he's going to be doing such an important piece and uh, it's going to be unique and special and something that you know, we should buy for the collection. And uh, it was uh, going to be done out there in Sag Harbor somewhere at the motel. And so we'd talk about it a little bit and so on. And of course, in retrospect, I realized that he was planning his death, um, but at the time, uh, I couldn't put it together. I think if Ray had lived a little longer, he might have been the the uh, the internet prima donna. It would have been perfect for his kind of instantaneous uh, jumping thoughts, the, the, these almost uh, electronic connections that he would make in his own mind, and then they would sort of leap like a spark to the next mind. I think that getting things in the mail, actually holding something in your hand that you would then manipulate or alter was part and parcel of the correspondence school, but that doesn't mean that he couldn't have taken it into another dimension.